so now we will be uh, talking about this new topic that is alcohol dependence and withdrawal and its management uh, and dr agila c assistant professor department of psychiatry shri lakshmanana institute of medical science puducherry and vaidhur chennai so good morning one and all let's go to the slides Okay, so introduction. Um, what is what is alcohol now? Uh, why it is why it is studied so much? Because alcohol is basically a CNS suppressant, and it has got very deteriorating effects on brain once being dependent on it. But before that, there are ways to prevent it and uh, prevent the dependence, and also. catch the person at the right time right moment give them support and psychotherapy and proper de addiction setup everything can bring the patient out of all the hazardous effects of alcohol so alcohol consumption is usually associated with social and psychological and physical problems now that is why it is most widely studied and discussed and uh, it's always a huge a uh, talk of stigma in the society alcohol dependence previously known as alcoholism but this system is derogatory so it has been dropped out nowadays so this is the formula uh, c2h5oh are the derivatives of hydrocarbons now ethyl alcohol is also known as ethanol which is the most common form it is metabolized in human body by alcohol dehydrogenase and then to add, and then by aldehyde dehydrogenase now alcohol units the amount of alcohol in drink is measured in units now one unit contains 8 grams of alcohol now one unit is equal to 10 ml of 1 liter of 1% alcohol number of units is uh, equal to volume in liter into percentage of alcohol for example a 250 ml of wine is 10% alcohol as 2.5 So you can do the calculation here. It's two fifty into ten divided by thousand. So that comes up to two point five units. Now here we have one unit. Like these are the equivalents. Like you, you see, uh, we have normal beer, uh, two eighty four ml four percent. Then small glass of red wine. Actually, this is red wine, twelve point five percent. Strong beer half pint is two eighty four ml six point five percent. Strong beer large bottle can four forty ml six point five percent. Bottle of wine seven fifty ml twelve point five percent. Bottle of spirit seven fifty ml forty percent. Single spirit shot twenty five ml that is forty percent. Now you can see how it is increasing. Now that red wine is twelve point five, but beer strong beer. Our beer, any sort of beer, is going to be at this point, right? But a bottle of spirits, single spot, single uh, spirit shot, alcohol bottle. Uh, these are all uh, on the higher side. Then normal beer again, large bottle contains only 0.5 percent. Large glass of wine also consists only of 12.5 percent. So the government advises alcohol consumption should not be regularly exceeded. In men, it's only three to four units maximum daily allowed. Women, it's two to three units daily allowed. Now, alcohol dependence syndrome, a cluster of physi physiological, behavioral, and cognitive phenomena in which the use of substance or a class of substance takes on a much higher priority for a given individual than other behaviors that once had great value. So it is basically physiological, behavioral, and cognitive phenomena. Like all three are involved. So that is why there are severe pathological uh, features in the body. Like for, for example, the cirrhosis, behavioral. There could be even behavioral disturbances, and also it could lead to uh, problems like psychological problems, like 
uh, alcohol induced psychosis and cognitive phenomenon in the late stage, even alcohol induced neurocognitive disorders are very common these days. So, this is the IPD 10 criteria. Here we have uh, a definite diagnosis of dependence usually being made on the pre or like, for example, number one will be a strong desire or a sense of compulsion to take substance, difficulties in controlling, uh, physiological withdrawal state, that is, you know, withdrawal symptoms, uh, symptoms like tremors of hands, hallucinations, seizures, seizures, that is, withdrawal seizure also known as from fits or uh, delirium tremens, and then evidence of problems such that increased dose of psychoactive substance are required in order to achieve the originally uh, original effect produced by a lower dose. So uh, it's basically these things and neglect of alternative pleasure. Like they would have neglected all the interests, like all the social activities and all the different uh, entertainments and uh, family outings. Everything will be sacrificed for the sake of people. And persisting in substance abuse despite clearly they are aware. Like they will be having hazardous effects or um, harmful consequences. They know psychologically they can be affected. They, they know everything, but still they pursue it. Then we have criteria for alcohol dependence. It is narrowing of the drinking repertoire. This is by Edward and Boss. Priority of drinking over other activities, tolerance of effects of alcohol, repeated withdrawal symptoms, relief of withdrawal symptoms by further drinking, subjective compulsion to drink, reinstatement of drinking behavior after abstinence. Now these are the etiological factors. That is, from first we have biological factors. That is genetic vulnerability, comorbidity, comorbid psychiatric or personality disorder, comorbid medical disorder, reinforcing effects of drug, withdrawal effects and training, biochemical factors. Now, psychological factors we have curiosity, general rebelliousness. This um, actually this can be attributed to uh, you know conduct disorder which starts at the age of uh, 13 or even less 11. In maybe so even before the personality develops, that is antisocial we are looking at. But here these are the general psychological factors: early initiation, poor impulse control, sensation seeking, low self-esteem, psychological stress. Mostly uh, psychological always goes hand in hand with social, that is uh, father. Uh, grandfather, how the society is perceiving alcohol as concerns regarding personal autonomy, stress, trauma, loss, belief from the take escape from reality, lack of interest. The social factors, like I said, I said it's always a biopsychosocial approach. So here we have so social factors like peer pressure, modeling, ease of availability, strictness of drug law, enforcement, intrafamilial conflicts. Religious reasons, poor social familial support, perceived distance within the family, permissive social attitudes, and rapid urbanization. So, these could be like uh, out of which you can focus mainly on the intra familial conflicts and um, permissive social attitudes. Like these two are, um, according to the social factors, it's one of the most basics, you know, basics of. It's like a basement, it's like lame basement for alcohol dependence. Now, this intra familial conflict, like father, mother fight. Then we have the permissive social attitudes, like in certain countries, it's, it's so it's, it's so fine, it's so legal, the whole family gets drunk. So, those kind of permissive social attitudes and intra familial conflicts. So, these basically lay the foundation and the Always, almost, most of the cases, it's always because of the peer pressure. Now, peer pressure, if I have to say, it's always the starting point of any alcohol dependence. So, peer pressure is one such thing. And these are the types of alcohol dependence that is alpha, excessive drinking, ability to abstain. See, now, uh, we are going into different types of uh, drinking pattern. 
So it's basically a drinking pattern, we can say. There are maybe excessive drinking, but they have the ability to abstain. Beta, there is excessive drinking with complications, but no dependence. Now, this we can uh, notice around in Pondicherry. You can see there may be excessive drinking with complications, but there won't be. There are many people like this, you know, we, who get admitted in our indoor setup, but they, they don't have dependence. It's just on the bordering on the harmful use or hazardous use. But it's always excessive drinking with some or the other complication. Now, gamma and malignant alcoholism is this gamma type, which is also known as malignant alcoholism, is physical and psychological dependence, inability to abstain. Now, delta will be inability to abstain, minimal social destruction. Now, epsilon will be dipsomania, that is free drinking. Now, this epsilon is like um, sort of emotional drinking, which is usually. Um, and females like epsilon and delta you can remember in English to abstain it is minimal social disruption there is not much of social disruption now the gamma is the most dangerous like you can see there is both physical and psychological dependence now cloning this classification here we have uh, type 1 and type 2 um, here we have that is normal, that is male limited and male limited. Gender is both sexes, type 2 is mostly male. This age of onset is more than 25 years, less than 25 years. And here we have age of onset, uh, more than 25 okay, etiological factors, genetic and strong environmental influences, genetic and limited environmental influences, family history may be positive, always positive, loss of control present, absent. Uh, other features, psychological dependence and guilt for a drinking followed by aggressive behaviors, spontaneous alcohol seeking, pre-morbid personality, harm avoidance. Basically. These people are novelty seeking. Now, if you see, these people are very much uh, like in the problematic uh, category. Like type 2 is more dangerous and type 2 is more prone for all the uh, problems basically like that we address the behavior. Usually, there is a positive family history. The father is drinking, the grandfather is drinking, or the society or the peer pressure, or uh, the group of friends he is having. So, you know, type two is always like you know leading to all this conduct and uh, antisocial personality disorder. Uh, acute intoxication and dancing condition following the administration. Now, if you can see, there is a disturbance in the level of consciousness, cognition, perception, effect of behavior, and other psychological functions and response. Now, acute intoxication is a brief period of excitation, generalized CMS uh, depression occurs. Then we have um, increased intoxication, then we have uh, increased reaction time, slow thinking, distract and little. Like you can see, say hello is like hello, like that. So, these are three attacks here and coordination. Then we have um, progressive loss of control, the fine disinhibited behavior, and there is pathological intoxication, small dose of alcohol producing intoxication, amnesia. That is, uh, we can see amnesia or blackouts basically. So they don't remember what happened. So here we have the body fluid alcohol levels. Now these are very important for for any person in the UG or PG or for even faculty level or anywhere. Like you know, we, we just need to be aware how much we take and what are what is happening inside our body like uh, as medicals we are so much exposed to all sorts of uh, you know con uh, like uh, parties or conferences everywhere you know alcohol is deep thing so it, you should at least be aware like what effect but at least you can you can just um guess by yourself by remembering such things like you know if uh, euphoria and vicariousness and coordination there then blood at all levels be keeping and here we have slurred speech ataxia, lab 
mobile mode drowsiness, nausea, and underdevelopment. This is for sporadic drinkers. Now, chronic tolerant drinkers, they know, they know what they are doing and they know what is happening. But this is for the sporadic drinkers. And lethargy, combative, stupor, incoherent speech, and vomiting at 200 to 300, coma, 300 to 400, and more than 500 will be kept. Now, chronic tolerant drinkers, minimal or no effect. That is 50 to 100, where we will where be the normal sporadic drinkers and we will be having like 50 to 100 level. And at that time, they won't be having any effect because of the problems they will have developed over the years of time. And then 100 to 200 will be sobriety or in coordination with euphoria. Then 200 to 300, mild emotional and motor changes. 300 to 400, drowsiness, more than 500, lethargy, stupor, and food. So they are actually one step uh, behind than the normal population because by 500, these people would be dead. But by 500, still they would be in stupor stage or coma stage or just be lethargic. So you can see the difference now that that's how important tolerance which is one of the main factors for dependence. Uh, alcohol withdrawal syndrome is a cluster of some symptoms we will be seeing one by one. So alcohol withdrawal syndrome that is tremors, nausea, vomiting, weakness, irritability, insomnia, anxiety, delirium tremens, alcohol withdrawal fusion, alcohol hallucinations. Now we can see time by time, like first six hours we have tremors, nausea, vomiting, autonomic hyperactivity, where there is increased heart rate, increased temperature, increased uh, blood pressure, and then there is weakness, irritability, insomnia, and anxiety within the first 12 hours, our first 6 hours, then 12 hours, then 12 to 24 hours, we have alcoholic hallucinosis, then 24 to 48, we have alcoholic seizures, then we have the delirium tremens from 48 to 72 hours. So psychological, if you see on this hand, anxiety, restlessness, irritability, insomnia, headache, there could be poor concentration, social isolation, and physical, we have sweating, heart palpitations, muscle tension, difficulty in breathing, tremors, and nausea, and vomiting. So like I mentioned, it will be 6 to 12 hours, there will be all these autonomic hyperactivity, tremors, and stuff. 6 to 48, actually, that is what ready for the Why they have kept 6 to 48 hours. And we have 48 to 72 hours for hallucinosis and 3 to 5 days. This, this is actually um, 48 to 72 for delirium and then 12 to 24 or uh, 24 to 48 will be for hallucination. So basically, the duration usually for delirium tremens will be only days, not like in weeks. So it is usually resolving in days. Delirium tremens is something if you don't treat, there is 20% validity. It happens within three to four days of complete significant abstinence. It's a short post recovery is within three to seven days. Now delirium tremens, the type of physiology here is basically there is increase alcohol increases gamma. Basically, alcohol is the same as suppressant, and it um, increases gamma. That is the inhibitory effect. of the brain also goes down, while gamma when it increases the inhibition of the brain goes up. Now that is how CNS depression occurs. Now what happens to this when you suddenly stop consuming alcohol? There is abrupt cessation and brain hyperexcitability because receptors are no longer inhibited. And repeated alcohol withdrawal symptoms more severe, there is kindling effect. Long-term changes in the neurons after repeated detoxifications. Now, what happens is the symptoms become more severe. That is, there's always a process called kindling. Kindling is the hyperexcitability of the neurons. So it becomes more severe with every detox, right? So here, um, uh, because of this, like you can see, when alcohol is suddenly stopped, 
on the consumption is suddenly stopping. There is hyperexcitability, and because the receptors are no longer inhibited by carbon, so glutamate is increasing. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. So the leading channels that you see now it's uh, like an, it's an acute organic brain syndrome. It is basically a medical condition. But here we have alcohol withdrawal delirium, which is due to alcohol and since that is managed to the game training. The clouding of consciousness with disorientation, poor attention span and distractibility, visual and tactile hallucination, psychomotor education, and attacks. So, uh, among hallucinations, there could be more of tactile hallucinations. Because there might be bad thinking behavior, and they'll try to pull out the IP lines, thinking that those are some unusual percep perceptual disturbances on the body. Now, the William Germans here we have the autonomic disturbances that is, tachycardia, fever, autonomic, basically autonomic hyperactivity also can be there, pupillary dilatation, insomnia, dehydration, and if untreated, like I mentioned, it's untreated, it's 10 to 20 percent actually. Five to ten percent may suffer all these collapse and infection but ten to twenty percent is the stats for death if uh the is untreated. Alcohol seizures, it's also measurable. It's a generalized semi-clonic seizure of ten percent, and onset is given twelve to forty-eight hours as we see. Multiple seizures are more common, that is epileptic may occur. But so far, we have seen in the uh, multiple uh, episodes of GDCs, GDCs, and which are usually controlled by Lorazepam, 30% delirium tremens follows. So, alcoholic hallucinosis, again, they are mentioning here, it is like um, hallucinations that can be partial or complete in the absence of 2% of patients generally report. Now here we have the complications of alcohol dependence. Here uh, we have uh, medical complications that is in GA, except the birth. Now why we have highlighted this is because fatty liver cirrhosis, hepatitis and CA, that is of liver and liver failure are the most common. Then we have reflux, which uh, excretitis, viruses, malaria, we syndrome, and also possible. In stomach, we have gastritis, eclohydria, peptic ulcer. Now you can see the most common will start from here. So, pages, stomach, intestine, pancreas, and liver. But the most dangerous will be here. And also the pancreas, acute pancreatitis, and vomit and relapsing. And of course, patient may die even due to malabsorption syndrome because it is. It is like protein losing entropy, which is a very, very common thing. And uh, in liver, we have this uh, almost invariably in every person's um, uh, you will see abdomen and pelvis, ultrasound, abdomen and pelvis of an alcohol dependent person. You will find that in liver. It is in either grade one, grade two, grade three, but you will find it. So here we have also symptoms and signs and symptoms of total hypertension. Like if you can see, we have um, number one, we have maltreated syndrome, autopsyphagic viruses, then we have uh, uh, capitalistate, then we have, you know, we, we may, uh, you know, like uh, encounter cases of hemorrhoids and metotresia. Like, you know, these are all very common. And uh, here we have the other uh, conditions, like we go into one by one. One case now, one case is uh, acute reaction to severe depletion in time. Severe depletion in time results from damage to the mammary bodies, but also medium nuclear uh, thalamus and adjacent areas of perivenular gray area. Brain. Now, onset is after a period of first and vomiting. Um, this is uh, hyperemia, petechial, hemorrhages, and astrocytic proliferation are, are the findings. And one case uh, is usually due to uh, B1 deficiency. These are the ocular signs. We have uh, nystagmus, ophthalmoplegia, it's actually internuclear ophthalmoplegia, and then we have 
bilateral external rectus paralysis, pupillary irregularities. These alone are of the ocular signs because ocular signs are not to be neglected, not to be ignored in the case of vertices uh, and development. So, the standards of thermoplegia, bilateral external rectus paralysis, pupillary irregularities, retinal hemorrhages, apelidema, and vision impact. Now, these are the higher mental function disturbances in um, Wernicke's. We usually say it as BOA, that is global confusion. Then we have ataxia. Then we have ophthalmoplegia, like ophthalmoplegia and ataxia. So, disorientation, confusion, these are memory disturbance, poor attention, distractibility, apathy, and ataxia. Now, Korsakoff psychosis, untreated time and deficiency, secondary to chronic alcohol use, organic amnestic syndrome, gross memory disturbance with the confabulation and loss of insight. Now, pathological lesion, that is dorsal medium nucleothalamus, mammillary bodies, this we have already studied, these are the pathological lesions. Now, this is one interesting syndrome for a disease called Marcia Favambi. Now, this was first noted in Italian uh, um, people who are dependent on alcohol, especially when they have this uh, type of uh, addiction towards even rice or uh, not rice, exactly. It's white wine. Sorry. So, white wine uh, basically, uh, they have increased consumption of white wine and cocaine and sort of things. So, somewhat they, they found the correlation that. The over a prolonged period, not only just white wine, just any sort of uh, alcohol content, whether it is uh, any any um, many many studies correlated with white wine. That doesn't mean white wine is uh, giving the exact cause, like it is the exact etiology of the disease. But there is a correlation in Italian studies. So uh, here we have there is corpus callosal atrophy. There is demarination of corpus callosum. We have seen one case of mushroom power big number so far. And uh, there is demarination of optic tracks, cerebral apparatus. And it is usually the clinical features are like disorientation, epilepsy, ataxia, dysarthria, hallucinations, plastic limitation, deterioration of personality and intellectual function. Now, this looks more like a, a, a neurocognitive disorder picture, but um, it, it can happen at any age, it doesn't have to be um, like neurocognitive disorder. The age factor matters here. A, a young person may also present with such features. Now, we should have this in mind and look for neuro imaging for links. So, miscellaneous, these are the miscellaneous where we have. Uh, uh, you can see uh, acne rosacea, palma erythema, like, like we already discussed all the potent hypertension signs, cardiomyopathy, wet delivery and dry delivery as well. Wet delivery is cardiac delivery, alcoholic myopathy, and accidental hypothermia and risk of CAD screening. Now, uh, these are the other, uh, um, among this, we have one thing that is to be discussed that is uh, um, infertility. Now, there are many, many patients that we have to complain often of um, erectile dysfunction and uh, also loss of libido because of the decreased testosterone levels. And uh, yes, the next condition is pelagra, where there are four Ds that is dermatitis, uh, delirium, dementia, and then large symptoms. So here we have alcohol control assessment. Here, uh, the street taking is most important. Also, breath analyzer. Then uh, PTINR, of course, LFT, CDC, your routine. And uh, here we have the management. Uh, we apply two scales mostly on a regular basis, like uh, CIVA, AR2, Clinical Institute Control Assessment of Alcohol, still revised. And we have short alcohol withdrawal scale 3 are both 10 item scales which can be completed in around 5 minutes basically. So we always apply this to choose the regimen for, um, for, the, for the detox basically. Once the detox is over, then we go for the addiction. It's done in two steps. Now, 
because we will be going to the detox. So, let's just keep in uh, uh, laser preparation for detoxification. Here we have the management that is use of benzodiazepines and alcohol withdrawal. Now, here we have um, that is typically given for seven days. Now, here uh, it's like um, you have it for the uh, fluoride oxide, that is the benzodiazepine of choice. But instead of the liver compensation, you can only do fluoride oxide. The ideal option is fluoride because fluoride oxide is metabolized by liver. Then, shorter acting benzodiazepines such as lorazepam or strongly oxazepam can be used in a compensated liver disease. Then, longer acting may be. Uh, helpful definitely, it's not maybe it's definitely helpful in preventing seizures and delirium. And um, in patients, should be withdrawn over two to three weeks. We usually try within one week, that is our target. Then, dosing regimens are associated with fixed dose. Now, fixed dose is something we we fix the dose. Okay, this is the dose we are giving for mild, it is usually a very small dose, like you know, 25. Uh, half a tea or 100 milligram of blood as oxide. For moderate, it is usually a larger dose. Now, larger dose, we usually um, give more than 100. Now, that will be a larger dose. But uh, for milder dose, it will be less than 100. That is of um, blood as oxide. Usually, the treatment should be adequate within 5 to 7 days. Now, uh, management the severe alcohol dependence requires even larger doses of blood as oxide. Intent for daily monitoring is required. So, this is the same. And fixed dose. Fixed dose is first 24 to 48 hours. If you fix the dose, for example, uh, in our setup, we commonly use okay, we get the USG reports and there is some compensation of liver. We just put them on your as now, after applying severs and uh, saws, if the scores are very high, then definitely we can go to 16 mm. So that doesn't matter. That, that is to prevent the delirium tremens. Now, here we have the flexible regimen. Maybe it may need to be prolonged beyond the first 24 hours. So don't undertreat or overtreat is the key. Now, here we have the front loading. Front loading is initial loading of medication as the 120 or 100 as the box set is given. Then, initial loading is given, after which the further doses are between every 1.5 to 2 hours until light sedation is achieved. Cessation once light sedation is achieved, then monitor the patient every 2 hours. Now, this is the front loading. Now, this also we have done. We first give the a good dose and then that is 100 mg uh, chlorazepoxide or diazepam 20 or lorazepam we can go to 4 to 8 mg. Now uh, with this we'll wait and then with every 2 hours, every 2 hours, every 2 mg, every of lorazepam or 10 mg of chlorazepoxide or uh, 5 mg of diazepam, but 5 mg of diazepam is usually higher. So better to Stick with lorazepam and fluorazepam oxide. So, this is the management. And for severe dependence, it's the first 24 hours that is day one. First dose immediately stack after addition. The dose of fluorazepam oxide should be within the range of 5 like I said. And subsequent dose should be administered during the first 24 hours. And uh, 5 to 40 will cover almost all circumstances. But in severe dependence, you can go uh, more than 100, and uh, there are cases we have been up to uh, 200. So uh, uh, that was a severe dependence, and uh, doses of about 250 is not uh, prescribed usually. But uh, we can go up to 100 uh, if it is very, very severe, and we can rapidly down that rate. So it is called baseline dose, then it is used to calculate the subsequent doses. Uh, re uh, reducing regimen. So, day 2 to 5, load as oxide in the barrel dose of 4 times daily. So, this is how it is done. And observation and administration. Here, each set of observation finds a platform control field, FIBA, AR, and source and clinical observation. That pressure of heart rate, pulse oximeter, 
and breath analyzer. The observation should be recorded during the admission procedure immediately after arrival throughout the first 24 hours approximately every one to two hours. The frequency will also depend on the severity of the fall. Why is daily observation from day two to six? Now we keep doing this almost every every six hours regularly because uh, we have a 24 hour uh, intern in the ward and he does all the monitoring and if something goes wrong uh, immediately the uh, post graduate is called upon or the consultant is called upon so you know this is very much followed in our setup if the patient is asleep don't wake them up and if the patient suffers hallucination will increase the dose like Assisted with verbal and medically compromised patients, that is, like I said, a uh, better option would be lorazepam as soon as we almost always get the USG abdomen, that is, a sonography of abdomen and pelvis done so that we get the liver status, we get to see the grade of fatty liver or it is cirrhosis, whatever, like uh, whatever the liver status is, and soon that would help us. We do it on an OPD basis so that. By the time the patient reaches the ward, we'll be getting the results, and by the time we'll be starting with the regimen we want and with the drug we want. So, uh, of course, approximate equal and those of them, the residents are follows. This is very important that is, diazepam 5 mg is equal to chlorazepam 16 mg is equal to oxazepam 15 mg is equal to chlorazepam. Now, oxazepam is also useful in patients with chronic respiratory disease and majority of dependent drugs are smokers, so always use a withdrawal as a single Now, um, you, can, you can start on, uh, you can definitely you have to start a patient on injection timing because uh, uh, there is um, usually a fluid loss in the body. Uh, and the patient might be dehydrated. So when we give, suppose if we want to give a, a fluid, say we are giving glucose, and what happens in the brain is there is glycolysis that is going to take place. Now glycolysis, uh, there is a step in which uh, thiamine pyrophosphate is a cofactor. Now already thiamine is depleted. Once on top of that, if we are going to administer glucose, that is 5D or uh, DNS or simple plain DNS will do. Still, there would be much more depletion of time, which would precipitate burning case and development. So always remember to always put in a ampoule of uh, uh, time and or uh, like you know multivitamin ampoule into the DNS before administering the fluid. So always be careful with that. Now, because uh, these are the pathways, like in the presence of ATP, it is converted into thiamine pyrophosphate, which functions as a carbohydrate metabolism. That's what I said basically right now. So it is a cofactor in glycolysis as a coenzyme in the decarboxylation of pyrolytic and alpha ketoglutamate acid. So uh, it's actually involvement of three. Uh, uh, cycles. Now, one is the glycolysis, the other is the pentose phosphate pathway, and the other one is the Krebs cycle. So, you know, all these three are interconnected with time and pyrophosphate. So, that is why um, we have to be very careful uh, while administering any fluid for that matter. Now, possible mechanisms you can see the time deficiency is inadequate intake of this. Decreased activation of thiamine to the thiamine pyrophosphate, reduced fatty storage of thiamine up to 73%, inhibition of intestinal thiamine transport due to decrease in thiamine activity, impairment of thiamine absorption due to ethanol related nutritional deficiencies. Now, prophylactic use of thiamine, like you can see, um, 300 mg daily during drug assisted alcohol withdrawal and periods of high alcohol. Now, 300 to 500, we can keep it as a standard. And um, uh, usually, uh, at least four ampules, uh, that is uh, complex vitamin, three times daily to, for two days we used to give. And uh, you can see IV infusion over 30 minutes in 100 ml NSO. 
100 ml that is sodium chloride uh, oral time in 100 mg three times uh, daily for three to six months that is uh, we we have a good uh, plan for let's say we previous we can have now prophylactically we have this uh, I am I V like uh, like I said usually uh, when the person comes to casualty we have a tendency to start okay let's start DNS but that is not the way it should be always we have to keep counting in our heads that to put the ampoule in the DNS just put an ampoule of the complex or time and anything that is available just put it in and then start so always remember you now that to be precipitating burning. So, so this is like a prophylactic management. Now seizure prophylaxis, uh, we may not use any uh, carbamazepine uh, like or uh, sodium malpate or any antiepileptics. Now this is very particular here if we can take with untreated epilepsy. Epilepsy is as such a disorder, like it is a disease by itself and it is not, and seizure is just one episode of epilepsy. So seizure is basically due to alcohol. So obviously, which is the most effective here will be the benzodiazepines because alcohol is equivalent to benzodiazepines because both act by GABA activation. So here it is like the best option would be a benzodiazepine, but here you can see very carefully what it is written it's with untreated epilepsy. The person is already an epileptic. So in that case, you can definitely start up. So seizure management, alcohol-related seizure usually occurs within 12 hours after cessation, and rarely it goes beyond 48 hours. And we have not seen a case of uh, status epileptic is due to alcohol withdrawal, but there can be cases who a person who's already epileptic can go into a status. And, um, uh, lorazepam injection stored in the fridge could be to the second dose of the team that's required. Now, if seizing is prolonged, then stay a uh, status of let's see a senior medical advice. Usually, we don't have to manage it in our ward, psychiatric ward. Always, if there is prolonged seizure, then we may not wait and we have to send the patient immediately to the medical ward or medical ICU. So, lorazepam 2 to 4 mg IV is a single dose that is. Uh, di uh, it can be diluted one is to one with water for injection before administration. Now, delirium tremens again, the, usually uh, lorazepam will be a better option. If the patient is not setting up the three doses of lorazepam of the MG, then we can consider escalation of lorazepam, escalation to lorazepam that is two to four mg oral IM or IV. Now, IV would be a better option. Repeat if required of the two doses at 15 minutes interval. Always consider oral before the IM group. Absorption from the injection site is considerably slower if the intramuscular route is used. Uh, like I said, IV is a better option. Now, using malopredo can be used for perceptual disturbance when the patient is uh, patient has got florid hallucinations and uh, patient is very much agitated and extremely disturbed and um, maybe uh, trying some having some parasocial behavior. It is best to always sedate the patient with I am haloperidol. Usually, uh, we prefer I am uh, over IV because uh, IV has IV haloperidol that is intravenous haloperidol injection might have Ages of sudden cardiac death, so we need to be the teeth of here. So, uh, here we have naltrexone as a, as one of the now coming on to the anti craving aid. Now we have acamprosate. Now, acamprosate is one of the anti craving, it is an NMDA antagonist. Now, here it is like the dosage is if it is uh, this weight is the person's weight is less than 60 kg, then the dosing would be 666 mg twice daily. That is 3, 3, uh, 333 in the morning and 333 in the night. That is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 666 twice daily. But if it is more than 60 kg, then it is going to be in the 
morning 6 66 afternoon and the night now you can see how they post beautifully it's for the patient being less than 60 more than 60 we are tedious now it's less than 60 we can keep it as 66 in the morning 33 in the midday and 33 in the night now naltrexone usually uh, we have seen patients who have had diarrhea I and mean, there might be patients who want to stop it because of these unpleasant GI disturbances but still we can assure them or we can give them some anti diarrheal agents or any uh, any other drug that could help them symptomatically and we should motivate them so naltrex not naltrexone I'm talking about acamprosid no naltrexone is the opioid receptor now this is FDA approved and it is usually we put the patient on the KMG and they told it very well. Separate oxygen has been discussed with higher doses. So it is to be avoided in the oxygen. Now disulfan is an anti-abuse. If the deterrent is not an anti aging always remove the deterrent. So we know the mechanism of action, we know the uh, enzyme aldehyde dehydrogen. First alcohol is converted to aldehyde by aldehyde dehydrogen, aldehyde by acetic acid by um, acetic acid uh, dehydrogen. So, first we have aldehyde dehydrogenase. Now, aldehyde dehydrogenase, uh, it is actually the enzyme which is inhibited by the cell. And I'm sorry for that, uh, I will explain it a little bit wrong. It is aldehyde to acetic acid by aldehyde dehydrogenase. So, diselfam inhibits antihydrogenase. Now, contraindications are cardiac failure, coronary artery disease, history of vascular disease, pregnancy, breastfeeding, um, liver disease, and peripheral uh, uh, neuropathy. Now, baclofen is one good uh, agent we have got in the recent days. Baba receptor agonist and super relaxant. The anti clearing and anti reward effects of baclofen can appear to relate to its agonistic action, the GABA P receptors in the VTA area. Again, VTA is the mental technical area of the meso, that is the uh, midbrain. So, doses are 10 mg PDUs. And alcohol induced psychotic disorders, alcohol induced mood disorders, alcohol induced, this, these are the um, common disorders that are related to alcohol. Then we have alcohol induced anxiety, 80%. Then alcohol induced amnestic disorder and alcohol induced sleep disorder. A prognosis, no antisocial PD, then it is a good prognosis. Close family, contact, life stability, good job, good prognosis. Full course of initial rehabilitation, good prognosis. Now we have, we have alcoholic anonymous where uh, we have a group of people who have uh, been dependent and now are in abstinence, come along together, uh, sit in a circle and discuss their entire story. Now that's a very good uh, uh, discussion. It's like a group therapy and uh, there can be a help for the psychologist, anonymous, usually a psychologist. Now uh, counseling to motivate for abstinence. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.